So, Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he visited, or he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour of the day. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting him and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore... We are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. And that's the end of that chapter. Okay. Thoughts? Just off the top of your heads, anything? Not yet. 
Well, he's doing what, what Paul would end up doing, which is preaching to the Gentiles. Right. And, you know, making clear that that all were welcome. Right. And in this particular case is a little unusual. We'll get to that when we get to that part. Um, so he's a Roman soldier, Cornelius says. Right? Um, is there a note on what the Italian cohort is? I don't remember who they were. Yeah, I am not sure. I'm not sure what the Italian cohort specifies specifically. So, uh, Roman military units, you had you had a legion, which is like six thousand people, and then you had usually ten centurions. But well, you had six thousand infantry, and then you had uh, so many uh, horsemen, uh, slaves that carried the baggage train. Uh, and the animals with the baggage train, all that. So it was all in all, it was closer to, by the time you get done, about 10,000 people. But then your foot soldiers were divided into uh, centuries, uh, or cohorts. Cohort. No, you had cohorts first, which are about 600 people, and then this, and the, each of those 600 would have centurions who got 100 guys under him. Uh, so a centurion is usually a commander of 100 people which is where the word you know, century, 100 years, same root in Latin. Uh, so you got this Roman soldier, but he is a believer, and he has a vision that says, oh, go find Simon Peter. Meanwhile, Simon Peter has a vision that says, this guy's going to come looking for you, and you need to go with them. But first he has to have this weird dream. Uh, so the sixth hour, that's about noon, because uh, the first hour of the day is 6 a.m., so about noon is about the sixth hour. Uh, and then the ninth hour when Jesus died, that's like three. Uh, so about noon, so it's time for lunch. He's hungry, he, they're preparing lunch for him, and he has a vision. He falls into a trance, and he sees the sheet come down that's got all kinds of animals on it. So they're going to be clean and unclean alike. And Peter's very particular. Peter is one of these guys that, oh, you got to do all the Jewish stuff, right? So he would be like some of the people we've seen uh, elsewhere, and you'll see them men mentioned other places in Acts and in the epistles. They'll be called the Judaizers sometimes. And what the Judaizers were were Christian converts that believed you still have to do all the Jewish stuff because you're still a Jew. So you got to do this, follow all the Jewish law. So Peter has this vision where you've got all kinds of whatever to eat and says, okay, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter says, no, I've, I've never eaten this kind of stuff before and I'm not about to start. Uh, and then God tells him, no, what God has made clean, don't call common. So God has now told him everything's clean. You, know, you can eat bacon, you can eat shellfish, you can eat whatever. None of those dietary laws apply anymore. Uh, so he has this vision, and now he knows, okay, I can eat what I want. And not only that, all this other ceremonial stuff doesn't matter anymore either, uh, which is important. So if you go back to, like, Leviticus, and you have all those rules, you know, don't eat shellfish, don't eat pork. You know, you can't have uh, fabrics made of two different kinds of material. Uh, you know, you can't have, like, wool and linen in the same garment, they have to be separate. All these different rules they have, you can't eat an animal that's been cooked in its mother's milk. Stuff of that nature. Uh, all of those dietary laws and all the other laws, uh, you know, if someone lies with a man as with a woman, you have to take them outside the city gates and stone them to death with stones. Okay. All of that is part of the ceremonial law. Why do we have the ceremonial law? What was it for? To show the Israelites as God's chosen people to keep them apart. Right, so you have children of Israel who have to be different from everybody else in the world. They're surrounded by pagans. They've always been surrounded by pagans. You have Assyrians, you have Babylonians, you have Greeks. You have all these different 
races and cultures that surround them who are pagan. And then you have God's chosen people, meaning they were chosen because that's where the Messiah is going to come from. So God ensures that they are going to be different from everybody else in the world. And one of their ways to do that is they dress weird, they eat strange food, you know, they have all these rules, uh, they have weird hair, they have all these things. Um, circumcision being the big one because everybody exercised and bathed uh, a lot of times communally, uh, especially in the pagan nations. So you knew if a man was circumcised, it would be obvious, right? So like, oh, oh, what's that? Why? Why would you do that? That looks like it hurt. Because uh, a lot of them had it done when they were adults. But, I mean, the Jews did it from early age, but you converted to <coughs> Judaism, you had to get your schmeckle clipped, no matter how old you are. And that's not fun, apparently, when you're older. So you have this big visual indication that you are different from everybody else, right? Uh, and now Peter has this vision and says, yeah, none of that matters anymore because the Messiah came. He's, he's been, he lived, he died, he rose, he ascended, he's gone. He's been here. None of that stuff matters anymore. You don't have to keep this ceremony of law. There is no reason to be separate from everybody else. So now the gospel is for everyone. And it was unlawful for Peter to even go in their house. Right? You're not supposed to associate with people who are not Jews. Um, you certainly weren't supposed to eat with them. That's what the Pharisees were all uptight about with Jesus, right? Because he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, as they always said. So anybody who wasn't a Jew is a sinner, right? So whenever he said sinners and tax collectors, tax collectors were traitor Jews because they worked for the Romans. So they weren't Jews anymore because they were evil, uh, because they worked for those nasty Romans. And then sinners is just a catch-all term for non-Jew. Because if you're not a Jew, you're, you're a sinner. Uh, so if you eat with those people, that makes you ritually unclean. You cannot do that. Now there is an interesting, one interesting thing. Uh, let's start. Do, 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 do. Where does it say it? It says, I think it says it when, when Cornelius has a vision. Yeah, verse 5, uh, where Cornelius is having the vision. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging, lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. So Simon being a tanner, He's unclean. He works with dead animals. Right? So he works with leather. That makes him ritually unclean. So technically Peter shouldn't be with him either. Which is one of the ironic things. Uh, I need to check into that because that yeah, so it, there is actually a note that says ceremony unclean. Yeah, so technically Peter shouldn't even be in his house either. He's ceremonially unclean, which makes Peter unclean also. So, is there pick and choosing going on about what's, oh, that's maybe okay, and this isn't? Probably. Don't we do that, right? Well, I think it more shows a transition that Peter's easing into an understanding and an acceptance. That could be. So, I, I think it's a step by step process more than. That could be. Than just picking and choosing. Yeah, so. You know, even, maybe even Peter is going through, but he's maybe on the, like on the QT, he's staying at this guy's house, but in public, like going to visit Cornelius, that would be scandalous for him to go into his house. So he has this vision to see, okay, you don't have to worry about all this stuff anymore. Because he probably, if you go to a Gentile's house, can you eat? I mean, forget about the fact you're not supposed to be in his house. Can you eat what they put on your plate? They're going to probably put unclean foods on your plate, right? Maybe Wouldn't it? it would depend on what they put on your plate. It did, but the I mean, <clears throat> chances are they're going to put something on your plate that you can't eat because, like, oh, and if it's touching the other food, that makes the other food unclean. Everything they put on your plate, there's one unclean thing, means you can't eat anything, technically. So God takes care of that with this vision, saying, like, oh yeah, none of this, none of this matters. And speaking of picking and choosing, you know, people still do that to this day with the Jewish ceremonial law as Christians in America. 
for some reason, American evangelicals love all those laws to pick and choose uh, which ones they're going to follow and condemn other people for not doing it. Uh, because it makes them feel superior, I guess. Uh, so it's like, oh, well, yeah, you know, it's, you know as it says in Scripture, um, uh, you know, you know, homosexuals are supposed to be God hates facts. I hope I harp on Westboro Baptist Church because they're an easy target. All right, so Westboro Baptist Church, God hates facts, which I've said it before. But where do they get that from? They get it from the Levitical law, the ceremonial law that says, yeah, homosexuals are supposed to be killed. That's for Jews in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant before Jesus came. That doesn't apply to us. That's not a, those aren't laws we have to follow. If you're going to follow that, well, then you better follow all of them. All right? If you're going to follow God's, if you're, if you're going to follow them, follow them all. Don't pick and choose. But that's wrong, too. All right, because none of them apply. Okay, but, I mean, it, Westboro Baptist is an easy target because mm. we know that they're crazy. Okay. <clears throat> but do people know that it happens right here in your everyday neighborhood? Because I can tell you firsthand, because I have heard the sermon, sat there and listened to it, that the Methodist Church in Thompson, two miles from here, says that gays should be stoked to death. Mm. Yeah, and that's where they get that nonsense from. It's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, <coughs> excuse me. So, are we saying, oh, well, you know, the church embraces homosexuality. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You're welcome here. I'd like to see all of you on Sunday morning, if you're listening, someone out there. Uh, does that mean we condone it? No, but all sexual sins are sins. Homosexuality all, is a sexual sin. And all sins are the same. Yeah, and all sins, all sins have one penalty. What is that? The death, death. penalty. By God. If it's a sin, it's punishable by death. But God sent Jesus so that if you believe he died and rose for you, that you will not go to hell for all of your infractions, which is as simple as stealing a candy bar or cheating on your wife or being having homosexual relations, whatever. All sins are sins. And they all come under the penalty of death. Isn't so, that the whole point of being the sin, not the sinner? Yeah, I think so. Um uh, so we're going to call it, you know, so everyone's welcome here, but we're going to call it what it is. It's a sin. Well, guess what? We're sinners. We're all sinners. It doesn't matter what your sin is. You're a sinner. It's not like, it's one of those things, again, where we try to anthropomorphize God. I'll come to that in a second. So we don't have to do the things the old covenant says because guess what? We're not Jews. We don't have to follow those laws because under the New Covenant, all that matters is the Ten Commandments. So where the Ten Commandments overlap with the ceremonial law, then yes, you have to do what the Ten Commandments say. So it's not suddenly okay to have homosexual relations. No, it's still a sin. It falls under the Sixth Commandment. You know, you shall not commit adultery, which includes any relation, any sexual relationship, out, any sexual contact outside of marriage, man, one man, one woman marriage. So that is everything. That's porn. That's that's uh, homosexuality. That's looking at a woman with lust in your eye. Everything that all falls under the six under that commandment. So all of those things are equally sinful. But there is no caveat. And oh, by the way, if you're gay, we have to take you outside the city gates and stone you. No, that doesn't apply. That was to keep those people separate from the rest of the world visually so that you would know this is where the Messiah is coming. Once the Messiah came, all that goes away. But adultery is still a sin under the Ten Commandments. Therefore, it is still considered a sin. It doesn't make you a special kind of sinner. We are all equally sinners. Uh, but yet, for some reason, we want to pick and choose of that because, again, uh, in the Christian church in America today, especially in the somewhat conservative churches, that is easy for people to latch on to. Well, I'm not gay, so I don't have a problem with saying this stuff because it makes me feel better because I'm not like that. Not realizing that that in and of itself is actually sinful. So, but, And then there's that whole judge not lest ye be judged thing. But yeah, that, that's where American Christianity goes completely bonkers. 
is they want to pick and choose all this stuff out of the Old Testament and act like it is, you know, etched on a stone tablet somewhere where where it isn't. You know, it's not one of the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments tell us very clearly what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And the penalty for all of those things is any infraction, one infraction, is death. Because they all boil down to the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. Because every time you sin, you're trying to make yourself God. You're trying to have things your way. That's what sin is. is that you want to do what you want to do. Every time you do that, you try to make, you're trying to be God. That's what it all comes down to in the end. So all that nonsense, uh, not nonsense, but all that stuff in the Old Testament, all those penalties and rules and regulations, that does not apply to Christians. It never has applied to Christians. Anybody who tells you otherwise is reading it wrong. They don't understand the difference between the ceremonial law and the moral law. And the moral law is the Ten Commandments. Questions about that? Yeah. Anything? Yeah. Okay. What would you say to someone when they ask, since it doesn't apply to us now, why is it so important for us to know and understand? Okay. So, it all boils down to what I said, that we, God did those things, put those, those commands in effect, those laws in effect, specifically for his chosen people. They were chosen to be the line of people from whom the Messiah would come. In an unbroken line from Adam to... Mary and Joseph. So that line of people being from the tribe of Judah, that's where the Messiah comes from. And that made that made the people of Israel different from everybody else in the world. That was the whole point of it. Now, does that make sense to us? No, not really. It's like, well, yeah, some of that stuff seems pretty harsh and pretty weird, like the one you and I talked about earlier from Deuteronomy. Uh, if, if two men are fighting, that's Deuteronomy 20. Something like that. 29. Twenty something. Deuteronomy chapter twenty something. Uh, <coughs> if two men are fighting and one of the men's wives comes and grabs his opponent by the genitals to stop the fight, you have to cut her hand off. They're like, that's a really weird rule. And it's like the reason for it is, you know, it's not a simple matter of oh well he go, this woman just came and grabbed him by the junk to break up the fight. Well no, she's trying to unman him, literally, to stop his reproductive ability. And that was a serious, serious crime in the culture of that time. And there was, rule, there was rules like that in other systems of laws. It's not wasn't specific to Judaism. Uh, but they seemed harsh. It's like, why would you have a rule like that that seems pretty harsh? Well, that gets to what I was saying about who God is. He's God. We try to understand how God thinks. But we can't because we're not God. He's God. He, he's very far beyond humans. But we as humans anthropomorphize everything. We anthropomorphize our pets. We anthropomorphize... Anyway, why do children like to watch cartoons of animals talking and stuff? Because then they're like us. Wouldn't it be neat if animals could talk? Because they're like, it makes them more human. And that's fun. You know, we try to make everything in... Ter- we try to understand everything in human terms... God is so far beyond human terms, he's not understandable. Only in as much as he has revealed it to us, which is what we got here. And sometimes, uh, holding up a Bible here in his word, that everything we know about God comes from that. That's not a lot of information, to be honest. It's enough, he's revealed enough for us to know how to be saved. Uh, but not enough to actually understand his mind. That's not for us to understand that was that talking about going back to day one, that was the original sin, right? Oh, if you eat this, you'll be like God and you'll understand good and evil. I want to be like God. That was our first sin. Knowledge that we're not supposed to have. That was the first sin. Right? Yeah, it, that's the hardest thing to understand. Right. So ask them, well, tell them why I asked you that question. Yeah, because what, like, what if somebody's reading the Bible and they get to this stuff and you're like, why is this? Like, what what is this stuff for? That's probably not the place to start reading the Bible, right? So, if someone comes to you and goes, "Like, I started trying, I tried to read," and we probably have those conversations. I've tried to read the Bible. I got like through that first book, 
and it just started getting weird with all these rules and stuff, and I stopped reading it because I was bored, and it was strange. And it's like, well, yeah, that's where most people, the first time through, they don't know anything about the Bible, just start reading it. Genesis, okay, I know some of these stories. And then you get to Exodus, okay, parts of that you remember. If you've seen the Ten Commandments, you get that part. Uh, and then you get to like Leviticus, and you go, what is going on? What is this stuff, and why do I have to know? And the answer is you don't. Okay, if, if a new, uh, someone wants to be a Christian and they're trying to read the Bible, send them to the Gospels first. The Old Testament is probably not the place to start unless you're going to cherry pick for them the Sunday school stories like Noah's Ark, Adam and Eve, you know, Cain and Abel, the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the Ten Plagues of Egypt, parting of the Red Sea, that kind of stuff. But if you're just like going to start reading the Old Testament, they're going to get to the, everybody's going to get to that same stop point and stop. They're going to be confused. They're not going to understand the relevance. Like, why do I need to know this? And the answer is, you don't at first read the gospel. And they're not going to want to come back to it. Yeah, and it, it, otherwise they're just going to put the Bible down. They're never going to read it again. That's as far as people get. That's probably not the best place for a, someone new to the Bible to start. It's just not. Because you don't until you realize what kind of book the Bible is, what kind of different kinds of literature are in it. You know, and as, for people listening, as Missouri Synod Lutherans, which is a very conservative uh, Christian denomination who believes in the, the literal interpretation of the Bible, but it's literal in context. So if it's a history, it's history. You're reading history. If it's a parable, it's a story that someone is telling to try to teach us something. If it is apocalyptic, like the book of Revelation, it's written in symbols and picture language. And it is not literal. You take the story of what you're reading literally and you interpret it the way that kind of literature is interpreted. Like the stuff we hated doing in high school. What does this poem mean? Well, what does the book of Revelation mean? Well, you have to learn how to understand it. You can't just read it and go, oh, I know what that means. No, you don't. Because you have to know half the Old Testament, like the back of your hand, to know off the top of your tongue what that book means. Because that's where all the images come from. So if it's apocalyptic, you have to know how to read it. History, no brainer. We know how to read history. Parables, we can understand that. We're being taught a heard, we're being taught a story to learn a lesson. Uh, if it's just a bunch of laws and regulations, well, why why is God telling us that? Because that was re recorded for us to understand why the children of Israel are the people they are. The why God sent them apart. I mean, they sent them apart. So that when Jesus came, people would go, that's the Messiah. Look at all the prophecies he fulfilled. Look at all the things he did. Now you go back and look at all those things in the Old Testament and go, oh, that's why this is here. This is why all this stuff is in Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Zechariah and Malachi, especially now during Advent, why a lot of those prophecies are important because that all told about the coming of Jesus. Uh, and that is for Christians, that is what the Old Testament the most important thing about the Old Testament is, is it reveals to us who Jesus is. You know, before the New Testament was written, that is all the early Christians had. And all everything in the Old Testament points forward to Christ. When you're not raised in that society, it's very confusing. You know, conversely, like we're talking about here with Peter, now imagine you are living in the New Covenant era. All right, this is the post- Jesus' world. Jesus is ascended. The apostles are establishing his church. And you've got all these Greek-speaking pagans are converting to Christianity. And all of a sudden, hey, all that stuff you grew up having to do, you don't have to do anymore. You don't think that was weird? And we understand why Peter was having a problem with it. Oh, I've never done this. Well, no, you've never done it because you're a Jew. That's what Jews do. They don't eat that stuff. But guess what? You're not a Jew anymore. Suddenly there's no such thing. There's no necessity for that. That old has passed away, the new covenant is what is important. But for a society of people that was raised that way for thousands of years of tradition, tradition, right? For the wrong word? Right? For thousands of years, your people have been taught, this is how you lived. And now all of a sudden, be told, yeah, you don't have to do that anymore. You're not going to just drop it. Yeah, it's, it, it's. <coughs> how hard is it to get Lutherans to change or Methodists? <laughs> Or Presbyterians, oh yeah, we're going to change the way we ring the bell on Sunday morning. It's going to take like stuff signed in triplicate after 10 meetings. right? So imagine how difficult it was to give up all that tradition. 
So like Peter has to do it right away. It's like, okay, he stayed at the Tanner's house. Now he's had this vision telling him, yeah, you're going to eat what's put in front of you and be polite because nothing's unclean anymore. And you can go in their house because this is who you're being sent to tell the good news to. He has to do it. He has to do an about face right now. He has to do 180. So he sent the vision. Uh, but for all these other people, they have to unlearn that. And that is what a lot of the, some of the stuff that's hard to read in the New Testament is about. Or they talk about the circumcision party. Like, what's the circumcision party? The other places, they're called the Judaizers, like I said before. Those are the people that, okay, I'm a Christian, but I was raised Jewish, and I still want to do all that stuff. Now, is there anything bad if they wanted to? No, absolutely not. You can do that if you want. But you don't have to. And don't tell other people they have to. Because that's being a legalist. That's saying, okay, here's these laws again that you have to do. And that was Jesus' whole problem with the Jews when he was here on earth, his own people. Because they made up rules, right? They had the oral tradition, oh, you have to do all this stuff. It's like, where is that? Where was that in the books of Moses? Where was that in the law? So they started adding stuff to it. You know, and then and that's what people do. That's what the Roman Catholic Church did for after, you know, it took about 500 years, and then they started going askew, the church started going askew, and they started making stuff up. And the next thing you know, you had things like indulgences and all the other nonsense, purgatory. Uh, all this stuff that's absolutely not in the Bible. Uh, because we start making up our own rules, right? Uh, instead of just doing what's in black and white, which is hard enough to understand. So you have these Judaizers in the circumcision party trying to tell the new converts, oh, you also have to do all this other stuff because that's what we do. And then there's a bunch of friction about it. Uh, people telling people they have to get circumcised. Well, you have to get circumcised. Oh, well, yeah, you have to. You get baptized, but you've got to get your schmeckle proof too because you got to do that. We do that. That's what we do. Now, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. All right? Uh, Sometimes and, it's really good for yeah, and Peter and uh, Peter, Peter and um, Paul will get into that shortly. That's going to be coming up where they're going to get into this stuff because Peter's still not quite wanting to let some of this stuff go, and Paul's going to set them straight, and then everything will be hunky dory, and they'll move on. Uh, but this, yeah, this is a big issue in the early church because it's really hard to give up thousands of years of cultural tradition. On a dime, you just don't change overnight. You should just give him a big plate of bacon. It would have made that transition a little better, yeah. smoother. Like bacon. Bacon. Yeah. You know, and even Paul is going to get called a little bit of a hypocrite because he had Timothy circumcised before he sent him off. You know, like why do you, if you don't have to do that? It's like well, to kind of smooth. Who is Timothy going to preach to? Jews, right? And he's a Gentile. He, you know, he was not of Jewish origin, so he had him schmuckle clipped to smooth that introduction, as it were. We'll talk about that. Smooth that introduction? What, you just whipped it out and showed people? Remember, they all bathe and, and go to the gym and stuff together. He's all naked. Because they didn't have, like, painkillers to yeah, they did. They had homeopathic stuff, but yeah, mostly it was like you're chewing this piece of leather because it's gonna suck a minute. <laughs> That's that, that, like the a good example of that in, in a film is a film called The Physician, uh, which it's a trilogy of novels. They only made the first one into a movie, and it's got I don't even remember who it was. So this kid, his mom dies of appendicitis. You know, a doctor tried to fix her. And didn't work because in those days you died of that stuff. And you know, he became fascinated by the physicians in England or wherever he started off at. And medicine was very backwards at that time. Uh, so he goes around with like a traveling physician, the medicine man, and he sells like snake oil too. Uh, and then he finds out, oh, where do I really learn real medicine? It's like, oh, you got to go to Arabia because Arab medicine is a thousand years ahead of everybody else. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go into Muslim territory 
and he kneels down in the desert one night, whips out a knife, and circumcises himself. Because yeah. like, they're like, oh yeah, they get him dressed up so he can walk in because he's Christian. It's like he's just going to walk into hostile territory. He wants to learn real medicine from these doctors. They're like, oh yeah, there's one other thing you got to do. He did it himself. Yeah, so he just kneels down in the desert at night and like, does like a prayer or something, and you just, you just see him in silhouette with the knife raised up. And you're just like, oh! So yeah, you can imagine. No, I can't imagine. It's just like, don't miss. Anyway. Yeah. Um, wow, well, I could barely watch the moment in Tom Hanks when he was stranded on the island. Oh, Cash when, when, when he knocked his tooth out? I could barely watch that. Wilson. My name's Wait. Oh, that was from Family Guy. Uh, yeah. All right. So, and, and that's why this story has a couple of unusual elements. You know, we have this: the fell Holy Spirit fell on them. Well, the Holy Spirit falls on anybody when they get baptized or when they hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit's falling on you. Okay. So, why does Luke say it this way? Was it visually different? Did they see something? Was it like on Pentecost? Maybe. They said they were speaking in tongues. Yeah, it says they were speaking in tongues. So is this like a mini Gentile Pentecost? Yeah, it is. And that's, and that's deliberate. Um, you know, God gave these signs deliberately, and Luke recorded these things like this deliberately. Because like, here, this is how the gospel is starting to spread to the Gentiles. And this is how these two groups are now actually one group. And then, you know, the writer to the Hebrews even points that stuff out. When you read in Hebrews 12 or 13 or whatever, where it talks about them going out on the mountainside, you know, like Jesus was killed outside the city, you know, on the hillside. Which means that is where, that was a... a Symbolic also of it coming out to the world outside of Jerusalem. That's not for here tonight, but we could talk about that in Hebrews a little bit. Um, all of these things are recorded deliberately for us to tell us something about the history of the church. Um, so what's the parallel? I, I mean, I kind of gave it away. So the, remember I said everything in Acts has a parallel in Luke. All right, so the big parallel here is, of course, what? Not really, because that's also in the book of Acts, but the first Pentecost. That's at the beginning of Acts. So what would be the parallel? Um, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you guys. Well, we don't know. We don't know. Yes, but... I think something to think about for next week is what is the parallel in Luke's gospel for this story? Now, I think that's an interesting question because usually there is a parallel. Something in Jesus' ministry that parallels with what's happening in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke organized and ordered things deliberately like that uh, for literary effect and for teaching. So we have recorded, you know, the supernatural indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, the people got baptized. Um, the times of day. I, I want to say that the parallel element is actually the crucifixion, but I might be reaching really hard. But the way the hours of the day are specified. Hmm. I have to think about that one. Somebody smarter than me probably wrote about this, so I'll see what I can find. The Gentiles hear the good news. John Peter gives the gospel in a nutshell. What about this? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. How about it? Well, there is a group that baptizes in the name of Jesus Christ because of that verse. And not the Father, Son, and not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who? I can't remember which one they are, but there is a denomination that does it that way. Can I Google it? Yeah, sure.
I want to say I, I want to say Church of Christ, but I'm not sure because I, I don't have all of their doctrines straight in my head all the time. It's a group, one of the evangelical groups like that. But when it says uh, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that actually means they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because being, okay. bap being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ means they're fulfilling the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Go ye therefore and, bap and make disciples of all nations by baptizing and teaching. That's all that means. Okay, there's Pentecostals in general? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Well, that's why they do that. I never knew that. Oneness Christology and the Oneness Pentecostalism. I've never heard of Oneness Christology. Okay, so that, that's a movement within Pentecostalism. It's like a subdivision. Oh, okay. Is it denial of the Trinity? Maybe. I don't know enough about it, but it sounds like it. That's all I have for that chapter, actually. That's pretty good. Yeah. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is we will see Peter report back to, hey, I went and did this, and this stuff happened. And it was amazing, basically. It's like, hey, look. And he, as the first among equals among the apostles, because Jesus did leave him in charge. He's, he's the head of, they're all equal, but he's kind of the de facto leader of the group, which is where the Catholics get the first pope from, whatever. Uh, he is the leader of the group. He's going to report back and say, hey, guess what? we got to do this with Gentiles too, because this happened. So it's not just for, not just for Jews. And then we'll go from there. Uh, we'll have another martyrdom. And then we'll see Barnabas and Saul in a couple chapters go off on their first mission. So that'll be fun. Okay, so if there are no questions, we will stop there and we'll pick up in the next chapter next week.